Hello everyone, my name is Shaoshan Liu. I'm the founder of Perceptin. We focus on uh, autonomous driving and robotics. And then in the past five years, I've been working on this field. Uh, today is about computing. Hopefully you, you guys already got some background on embedded system, FPGA design. Uh, today's talk is going to be divided into three parts. First part, let's do a crash course on autonomous driving. What is autonomous driving? Uh, the second part is our approach towards autonomous driving. The third part is about the problem we have seen in the past two or three years and how do we approach those problems. So let's get started, autonomous driving. So that's a diagram about autonomous driving technology. It's not really one technology, it's integration of many pieces of technologies. As you can see on the screen, uh, the, the pink part is the algorithm. There are a lot of algorithms used in autonomous driving. For example, localization. How do you localize your vehicle in real time such that you know where exactly the vehicle is? Uh, object recognition, if you see a pedestrian, you have to recognize there's a pedestrian in front of you such that you can avoid that. And then path planning as well. On, on the right side of the decision pipeline, you have path planning. How do you plan the path of the vehicle so that it can go from point A to point B? Um, but that's the pink part. A lot of people are going to talk about autonomous driving. It's all about the algorithm. But underlying it, to us, it's the hard part. How do you integrate all these services onto a computing system that can run on the car? And that's what we're going to talk about today. That involves the design of operating system, the design of chips. On the right side, uh, it's something that people don't often talk about is the cloud. You need a lot of cloud support. How do you generate a high definition map such that the vehicle can learn from the map uh, to know where it is and then to know the semantic of the environment? How do you do model training, right? You have a lot of different learning models. How do you design architecture for model training, data storage, and so on? Simulation is another part. So let's fly through these components and then we dig into the second part. What's our approach? Localization. The, Easiest way to localize yourself on the street of London, of course, is use your iPhone, right? Um, you have a GPS inside. For the car, it's the same. You have a high-end GPS inside. It's the combination of GNSS, which is uh, another name for GPS. And then INS is the inertial module, such that combining these two sensors, you can get very high accuracy. So that's a cheap way to do it. Uh, automotive grade GNSS receiver, about 10,000 US dollars. Um, if th that's the, the one Google uses, uh, Baidu uses, and so on. There's an expensive way to do it for localization. It's use LiDAR. Uh, it's a very expensive piece of sensor, $80,000 US dollars for this 64-line LiDAR to capture the environment. But that's not the most in expensive part. It's the HD map, the high-definition map that's very expensive. Take example for Mountain View or Santa Clara in the United States. To maintain a map like that, it costs millions of dollars per city. So who's going to pay for that? We don't know yet. Why is it so expensive to build a HD map? There are several reasons. First of all, you use a very high-end sensor to capture data. Second reason is that you have to build a lot of information on top of that. For example, semantic information. There's a KFC by the side of the road. You have to record that as well. So that's semantic information. There are layers of information you have to combine to generate this map. On top of that, you have to refresh the map weekly. That's why it's so expensive to maintain an HD map because your cars go out there to scan the map weekly to make sure it's fresh. Take another example, Google map, uh, take London. Uh, it refreshes itself every six months, but for HD map, it's weekly. That's why it's so expensive. The next way or more affordable way to do autonomous driving is to use visual autonomy, use two cameras, capture data in the environment, combine this data to refer uh, to infer how much distance you have traveled. So that's a very affordable way, but it's a very challenging technology uh, because the, the amount of data required, uh, the algorithm required to do it. So that's about localization. Now you know where you are. You know how to localize your vehicle. Second part is about perception. Today, when we talk about AI, it's almost like everybody's talking about deep learning. Same here. When we do perception, a lot of the network we use are deep learning networks. First of all, how do you detect there's a person in front of you, right? Um, there are several networks you can use. Fast RCNN, uh, it's been about two or three years, and SSD is more recent uh, that can help you extract persons uh, from the street such that your vehicle can detect, oh, there's a person in front of you. But you need to understand more than that as a autonomous vehicle. You need semantic segmentation. That's the picture of a street. On the right side, you have to know that's the pavement, that's the road. That's a tree, so that the car has a full understanding of the environment. Several networks for that. PSP Net, for example. 
it's very good network for segmentation, except that it's very expensive comp uh, computationally. That part, not many people talk about when we talk about autonomous driving. Planning and control. How do you make the vehicle move after it understands its environment, right? Uh, but that's a very hard problem to do. A typical pipeline or architecture for planning and uh, control is like that. It's very complicated. It takes input from perception, takes input from map and localization, goes through routing prediction, and goes through the core, which is the, the red box here. That's the core planning module. Uh, for, it's a layered architecture behavioral planning, then convert that into motion planning, convert that from feedback control, and then goes into a car. That's it, but all this has to be done within two, three milliseconds of time uh, to make sure the car is safe. Routing, uh, when we say routing today, you pull out your Google map, uh, go from Westminster uh, to some other places, right? That's uh, road level routing, but for cars, you need lane level routing because on the same road, there are different lanes. The vehicle has to understand which lane it travels on. So it used some traditional algorithms such as dice charts, A, A star, but we need to do more, need to do more fine tuning to uh, have it perform well on a vehicle. So let's do a very short cost breakdown for today's autonomous vehicle. Let's start with sensor. If you got a eighty thousand uh, dollar lidar plus a ten thousand dollar GPS, well the sensor itself would cost more than a hundred thousand. Computing hardware, uh, the first generation we work on, I was uh, working at a Baidu's autonomous driving project. The first generation is crazy. It's like $30,000 for just for the computing units, basically two servers. You jam the two servers together into the car. Even today, right, if you buy a NVIDIA PX2, it's 20,000 US dollars. Plus the map, the map, who's gonna pay for it? It's still open question. So for demo cars, such as Google's demo car, Waymo's car, um, it costs about 300000 to a fifty, uh, 500000 around that range. It's still too expensive to ship. So we take a different approach. Why not build a car like just like how you play with Lego blocks? We build the Lego blocks to allow people to build cars. We start with low speed in our environment, low speed scenario first, such that you can build your own modular design of a autonomous vehicle, such as this one. That's our Dragonfly pod. Uh, it's a small two-person pod. Uh, for campus like uh, transportation, we have six, seven modules inside of it. By combining these six, seven modules, you can build your own vehicle fairly easily. On top of it, we have what we call the Dragonfly uh, computer vision module. We'll dig into the detail of that, uh, but it performs two things. Active perception helps you to understand the environment. Localization helps you to track where the vehicle is currently. Next to it, it's the typical GNSS module to give you very high accuracy of localization. Underlying it, you have sonar radar for passive sensing. What do I mean by passive sensing? If someone crossing the street, the car detects it. It does, you, you don't want the car to send the information up for the, to the computing unit and then make a bunch of decisions and go down because the latency will be too high. So for passive sensing, it just means if I detect something in this range, I just stop. So that's perfect uh, to use sonar and radar. Underlying it, you need a chassis, right? Eventually, there's something that executes your command. That's the chassis of the car. And then on top of it, the main compute module or the brain of the vehicle is the planning and control module. So that's a better um, physiology uh, diagram or architecture diagram for design. You have localization, you have perception. Then in the center of it is planning control. Once the information goes through planning control, it goes down to execute. Let's zoom in to the passive perception system first. What would it be like to do a passive perception? Let's look at a very short demo. Say if you have a low speed vehicle, you want a radar in front of the vehicle to detect any pedestrian or any car in front of it. Let's say because it's low speed, we can restrain uh, the, the region to 10 to 15 meters to track any objects that goes through or in front of the car. So that's how radar works. A lot of people talk about millimeter wave radar. What exactly does it do? That's what it does. It detects the object and tracks it. So you see a long tail on the screen because it's tracking the object. Those are for people detection. What about for cars? If you have a large object crossing it, you can track it as well fairly easily. So how 
the, the, the range that you detect it really depends on uh, what's your braking distance at what speed. Uh, that's how you design the system. Sonar has much shorter range, but uh, that's the really the last line of defense uh, in case you are going, uh, in, in case radar missed the, the, the object, then you have sonar. You usually deploy multiple sonars in the car to detect any obstacles or any pedestrians. But really, when your sonar picks up something, you have to stop because it's like three to five meter distance that you detect. Yep, so that's a nice small demo for sonar as well. So we're done with the passive, uh, passive perception system. Now let's go to the active system. What does the active system do and what can computer vision do? And then later on we'll talk about the problem with computer vision. First of all, for localization, um, well, it, for a vehicle like that, it's very important that it localizes itself in real time. Uh, if you rely on GNSS, that's fine. Uh, to, that, that can give you very high accuracy. The problem is that on the street of London, there's a little building bouncing the signal around such that you don't get accurate localization results. That's when uh, computer vision kicks in. But that's not solely computer vision based. We have to fuse that information with multiple different sensors. For instance, IMU, the Initial Measurement Unit, to give you fairly accurate results within a short distance of time. But once you travel for five minutes, IMU is not reliable. Then you have the wheel. The wheel of the car itself can help you localize. It's called wheel autometry. When you, you fuse all this information together, you get very accurate results. That's the, the basic message here. Let's see a small demo uh, of vision, what vision can help you achieve. We have this full eye design, four cameras, two facing the front, two facing the back, so that you can perceive the front and the back at the same time. Inside of it, you have an IMU module to help you do uh, inertial tracking. And then we put a NVIDIA TX series chip inside of it, such that you do all the computing at the edge. So there are two main functions with this design. The first one is localization, obviously, that vision can help you to track the vehicle. The second one is active perception, how do you detect the environment? Let's look at localization first. We deploy this car in a campus such that we block the GPS and then we see how it works uh, for localization. So as you can see as the car travels, later on we show a screen that extracts what we call the feature points. Well, it's not very clear here, but we extract a lot of feature points from the environment. Through these feature points or the displacement of the feature points, we kind of we infer how much distance the car has traveled So that's a real-time trace, it's in red, it's going through, then later on we compare that trace with a GPS trace and against the map, then you can see that it's highly accurate to use computer vision. By the way, this technology is called VIO, Visual Inertial Automation, meaning that we are fusing vision information, inertial information to get automation, to get distance. So that's what we call a loop closure, such that we go through a loop that it goes back to the original point. We compare that to the map, and it's a very good result. So that's the first function you can do with computer vision. The second one is perception. Perception is really important. On the upper left, we, you see the original picture. Upper right, you see original picture with semantic information instructions, so that we detect all the labels, detect all the objects there. Lower left, you see the depth information. Lower right, you get the extracted information such that that's all the car needs to know. Uh, there's a person in front of me, the car next by it. There's several type of object that you need to detect. It's shown here on the lower right side. You wanna see the person crossing the street such that you can reduce the information you produce uh, at your planning and control module. So the next question becomes, well, what can you do with this kind of technology, right? Uh, you said low speed, uh, affordable. Uh, what kind of car can we build? We have a use case here, a very interesting use case recently deployed in Asia. It's a autonomous driving vending machine. So we have this vending machine deployed in Shenzhen, China. Uh, it's basically a big box with four screens to do advertisements using the Dragonfly sensor, sonar, radar, and so on, all the sensors we just introduced. And then we have the vending function, such that this thing goes around, say, in Disneyland, Disney Park. You can hail at it, have it stop, push a button, then give you a drink. Um, in this scenario, this person crossing the street, they can detect it using radar or sonar, such the car can stop, and then this guy 
can grab a drink from the machine using some mobile payment methods. So a lot of technology that we combine into this vehicle to make this happen. I think it's the world's first, very first uh, mobile vending machine. Uh, I think that's our future. Um, uh, when we talk about robots, autonomous driving, how do you monetize on autonomous driving? That's one way to monetize on autonomous driving. But there's a problem with this design. It only goes at low speed. The reason is because of computing. You don't have enough computing power to support high speed. For example, for visual autonomy, uh, how fast you can go really depends on what kind of computing power you have. That's why the PX2 series chip is so expensive because it delivers a huge amount of computing power, but at $20,000 per piece. So the question to us is, hey, we have this module. We want to constrain the whole cost within, say, $10,000. US dollars. We can allocate, say, 500 bucks for the computing system. How do we achieve that? FPGA is one way to go. So the design requirements here is modular, first of all. You want everything to be modular, such that you try to push as much computing to the sensor side as possible. Slam ready, meaning that you, in this case, we want to do localization. So there are a few requirements to make slam ready. For example, the hardware needs to be synchronized, meaning that the four pictures, when you generate four pictures, they need to come in at exactly the same time. Uh, that's hardware synchronization, low power. We want the whole system to burn less than 10 watts. High performance, we have four 720p YUV images at 30 frames per second. How do you achieve that, right? So as a prototype, we take a Snapdragon 820 cell phone. We move our SLAM algorithm on top of it and see how it works. It's fairly interesting. The first trick we use is called parallel programming. We have four cores on the chip. We have DSP, we have GPU, but we're not using that yet. We we'll just use the four cores. We use one core for image processing one core for IMU processing, one core for map generation, or two cores for map generation. That's how we got, right? That's uh, less than 20 frames per second performance. It burns a watt. So that's the current design. Um, then one step further, let's, let's try something new. Let's do some acceleration. Instead of just using parallel programming, let's use heterogeneous computing. Instead of doing feature extraction on one CPU core, why not offload that to a DSP? That's what we did. We offload that to a DSP. Boom, the performance goes up 30 frames per second instead of 20, but you burn one more watt because of the data copying and so on. And all these are real results. We, we, can, we measure it instead of simulation. Then we start asking ourselves, what's the perfect architecture for these kind of applications, AI applications in general? The bottleneck, especially in SLAM application, is really at the feature extraction and feature match, or the image processing front end. So why not have an architecture like that, what we call the Pi SOC architecture. SOC means system on chip, Pi is perceptin. You have image coming in, instead of doing a lot of data copying from CPU to memory, from memory to CPU, just feed it directly through the DSP, or here, in this case, a accelerator. And then once the acceleration is done, or a feature extraction is done, you send the extracted feature to a feature buffer. Just this simple step, you reduce the amount of data by 1,000 fold, uh, so that you reduce the stress, computing stress of the CPU core by 1,000 fold. Then once that's done, that's L1, L1 cache, you push the feature up uh, to trigger those cores to do the other functions. So that's the architecture we came up with. Then why not uh, implement it? So we implement the whole thing on FPGA, a silence FPGA. We achieve 120 frames per second for less than five watts of power by using this simple trick. If we compare that to a NVIDIA TX1, it's three X more power efficient and five X more computing power compared to that. And then let's do one more comparison. Intel Core i7, server level chip, 34 X more power efficient because you know Intel chips are not very power efficient, it's designed for servers. But we still deliver three X power uh, consumption reduction compared to Intel Core i7. So that's very amazing results. Imagine that you have a autonomous vehicle going at 60 miles per hour. That chip will be enough, and then it costs less than $300. A bit on design. Uh, how do we design it? First of all, how do you take four ways of camera data and feed it to the main computing port, right? You need to design a very special I.O., it's parallel port I.O., to go into the chip. So that really reduces all the data movement. The data movement between I.O. and memory, that's what caused it to be very slow. Then once that's done, 
we have synchronized image going into the VSLAM or Visual SLAM pipeline, the front end logic. That does all the heavy lifting. The extracts features, once the features are done, we feed it to the multi-core uh, for DMA, such that uh, it can really accelerate the computing of it. So that's more detail on design. I'm not sure uh, we have to go through this, but that's how we, we use some buffers to buffer all four images, and then we do data extraction and so on. So at the end, we can get a very good result. And there's even more detail about our feature extractor. We have several scientific papers up on our website. Welcome to check them out. They have all the details of the design. The second acceleration is feature matching. Once you extract the feature, you have to match the feature such that you know from this frame to this frame, what's the movement, which feature corresponds to which. So we need to build another accelerator. It's for feature matching as well. So at the end, I want to share some uh, detailed performance results. When we say it's 3x of this, 30x of what, 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 what do I mean by that, right? So if you've, you're familiar with FPGA design, the first table should look very familiar to you. There are several kind of resources that you use in FPG design. Lookup table, flip-flop for computing, SRAM for storage, and then DSP for acceleration. So that's the resource usage we use. And then uh, the utilization, we don't use too much DSP in this case, 6%, but BRAM, flip-flop we use a lot. And then uh, it's a silence, kind of low-end silence board. It's not that expensive. And then compared with software solution, we just presented the result. You can see the result compared with TX1. You can see the result comparing uh, with Core i7 and so on. But the core message is that it delivers very good performance. A lot of people, they, they saw these results, they asked me, what about ASIC, right? If you get these results, you can really move it to ASIC. You get 10x of power consumption optimization, another 10x of performance optimization. But once you move this to ASIC, it requires volume. Once we have, if we ship one million units of this, we will move it to ASIC. Core message I want to deliver through this talk is that when we talk about autonomous driving, um, if you talk to me about autonomous driving one year back, I'll tell you algorithm is the, is the problem, the bottleneck. We don't have good enough algorithm yet, but today we really think computing is the, the main bottleneck. We just don't have enough computing power. And the way to accelerate as a first step, FPGA is a very good choice. We've been doing this for the past two, three years, and then we have achieved very good results. Um, so that's the end of my talk. For more information, you can check out this website. We have all the data, uh, all the paper, and all the product on the website. And now I'm open to questions, if you have any. Thank you so much. Well, it could be. We never tried it before, but uh, it really depends on how they design their API. Uh, I think Movidius, Movidius is doing the right thing, but my previous experience with Movidius is they don't deliver enough computing power, especially for this kind of application. Do they use oh, I think they move into ASIC, but I don't know exactly what they accelerate in ASIC. Uh, but in this case, we understand exactly what we want to accelerate. That's why it's highly optimized. Uh, what do you mean by that? Um, your algorithm, is it a convolutional neural network? Or oh, it's not. It's, it's geometry. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's where Movidius is like not performant because it's not. It's, it's mostly designed for a, a neural network kind of. I'm sure they have some basic geometric acceleration, but mainly they focus on uh, deep learning, I think. All right, thank you so much.